What's happening, everybody? It's Sean with Reactions to the Classics, and today we got a reaction to Boss Stags' Silk Degrees album brought to us by our friend, longtime patron, supporter of the channel, Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Appreciate all you bring and appreciate all the patrons. If you'd like to support us in a way, check out the Patreon link below or the patron link on the end screen. I say it every video, but it's so true. The patrons make this thing go. We put up content every single day. It is incredibly time consuming, but a labor of love, but we appreciate any support you would consider. Now, Joseph obviously is very familiar with this album and the expert in it, at least compared to me, where I don't know much Boss Gags at all. So Joseph gave me a great write-up. So here we go. He says, my own entry point to Boss's catalog was his underrated 1988 comeback, Other Roads, which is a moderate hit in New Zealand, where Joseph's from. He lives in the UK now, but he was in New Zealand then. Reading the liner notes at eight years old, I saw a note from Boss that had a major impact on me. I mean, what eight-year-old reads liner notes? I mean, this guy used to, so I get it. It simply read, thanks to the immensely talented musicians for their contributions, and especially Jeff Picaro, for input above and beyond, which was undoubtedly the spark that made me start paying a close attention to who was playing what on any album that deigned to contain such information. It was another six years before Boz would release his next album, by which time I'd filled in much of his back catalog, mostly on vinyl. I can vividly recall purchasing this album for $10 New Zealand money, from the record store at a local shopping center, and to this day, have never seen a record as shiny. Now, while I can understand why this album is considered the pinnacle of his career, and the obvious choice within his catalog for a full album reaction, I can't say I love it more than anything else from the 74 to 94 period. As I've hinted above, he was never prolific, so that's only a six-album run in any case, and that's very odd for back then, right? But it does, of course, also have the deeper significance of effectively being the album that gave birth to Toto, for which we can all be forever grateful. Ain't that right? I mean, opinions vary on many things in life, right? Anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about the album in question. Silk Degrees was Boz's sixth major label album release as a solo artist. Prior to going solo, he made two albums with the Steve Miller band. He and Miller were childhood friends, but commercial success had largely eluded him. His previous album, 1974 Slow Dancer, had done best, peaking at 81, while three early 70s singles had scraped the bottom 40 of the Billboard Hot 100. As Boz put it in a 1977 interview, quote, it becomes frustrating after a while. It's sort of a cult following that was always very supportive of me. It was coming to a point where in order to have a meaningful career, you had to sell a certain number of records. I must say that Columbia Records has always supported me and encouraged me. I've been searching for a long time. A cult following is fine, but you need a broader general acceptance. Yep, that cult following is not going to pay the bills eventually, at least back then especially. The route he took to get there had a somewhat surprising origin, a Helen Reddy album. Silk Degrees producer Joe Wissert had produced Reddy's Music Music album and used Jeff Picaro on two cuts. He introduced Jeff to Boz and they hit it off instantly. Boz then switched hats and ended up in the producer's chair for guitarist Les Dudek's debut album. He hired Jeff on drums, but one element was missing. David Pache told his side of the story in a 1978 interview, quote, Jeff gave me my break in the business. He was doing Les Dudek at the time. Boz was producing and they needed a keyboard player. So it's like Fringe, you know, he called me and asked me to do it. I finished playing on that album, started playing some songs and little things, and Boz asked if I'd be interested in writing some songs with him for the next album. I was totally into it because I was really into writing songs at the time and not even close to being established as a songwriter because it's kind of hard to get songs recorded. Weissert suggested Paige and Skaggs go away for a few days to see what they could come up with. So as Paige explained, Boz and I went up to my dad's ranch and cranked out most of the Silk Degrees album on my dad's piano. Just see a nice sit in there. It just came like butter. We were soul brothers. In 2013, uh, Skaggs described David as his favorite all-time collaborator. Instead of working with him and Jeff, oh, they were the greatest. It was just wonderful working with them. They were friends. They were young. They were only like 20 years old when we got together, and they had fresh ideas and a lot of energy. We ended up going on the road together for a couple of years. They were just wonderful. The feeling was mutual, as Jeff explained in 1978. Boz was one of the first artists who, with us as studio musicians, Gave us unbelievable freedom as far as playing on the album. We were all real tight together on making that album. It was a unit. The unit was completed with David Hungate on bass, who would, of course, go on to join Toto with Paige and Picaro, and guitarist Fred Tackett and Louis Shelton, the latter who had worked with Paige, Picaro, and Hungate, triumphant in the studio as producers on Seals and Cross' 1974 Unborn Child album, and would use them again soon after for 1976's Get Closer. As Shelton recalled, quote, with the Silk Degrees album, I just happened to be available and David Page called and said, we're going to do this album with Boss Gags and it's going to be Jeff 
myself and David Hungate. Do you want to do it? I said, yeah. And it turned out to be one of my all-time favorite records I made with anyone. That's high praise, end quote. Fisher said that none of the tracks took more than three takes to record. Woe Down was the first track to be put down and was done in two takes. But as Paige explains, that was only because the first take wasn't recorded. Quote, we got the take the first time and we turned around and said, you got that right? And they said, no, we weren't rolling. From then on, it was when we're playing roll tape. So the next take was the tape. I bet that, com- I'm not, I don't know, maybe it didn't. For me, that conversation would have been a little uh, maybe R-rated when they said, no, we weren't rolling. But Joseph says, of course, while recording, nobody knew how this was going to land commercially. When Boz's track record, expectations were muted. It was a low budget affair with the musicians working for scale and not charging extra on weekends or for overtime. When it turned out to be a smash, Boz gave them each a $30,000 bonus. I'm not quite sure what that amounts to in 2022 money, but suffice to say Jeff used his bonus to buy his first house. Let me tell you something. I don't know really anything about Boz as a person, and it might be different. I don't know. But at that time, well, let me tell you something. That's telling you something about an artist who gives away that kind of money, right? I mean, that tells you what kind of guy he was and probably is. Joseph says, before we get into any track by tracks, I'm interesting, if only to me, he says to him, but it'll be interesting to me too. New Zealand chart stats I uncovered that I just have to share with a fellow chart geek. That would be me. I'm that fellow chart geek. For context, our album's chart began life in 1975. Okay. As a top 40, which expanded to a top 50 in 1979 and reverted back to a top 40 in recent years. So effectively, Silk Degree spent 62 weeks in our top 40 and notched another two weeks in 1980 and in the lower 40s, and charts.org.nz ranks it as the 206th biggest album in New Zealand history. Now, here's something wild. It debuted in September 1976 at number 38. It didn't lodge its second week in the charts until the following May. It ultimately spent 14 weeks in the top 10, but didn't get that high until February of 78, in its 36th week on the chart, the week after Boz's follow-up album, Down 2, then Wept, had debuted at number 9. Silk would peak at number three with DTTL ahead of it at number two later that month. I could go on, but that'll probably do on that score. And finally, Joseph says, just before, I'll just tell you what he's, just before you tell the good folk in internet land that you have the lyrics up, as always, not quite my man, because I got a little bit of research. I found this interesting, interesting quote from Boz in 1976, ex- explaining why his albums didn't contain printed lyrics, which was odd for back then. He said, I deliberately omit lyric sheets because I feel the basis of my music lies in the words. The act of concentrating on the lyrics within the melody is important. You have to listen. It shouldn't have to be in front of you. Well, I mean, yeah, that's why that's why Joseph's saying this, because I will have the lyrics in front of me. I'm sorry, Boz. It helps me follow more. There, you've been told. Or maybe Boz was just Michael Stipe all along. Inside joke. Love it. For me, I just found a little bit. It was released on Columbia in February 76. Peaked at two and spent 115 weeks on the Billboard 200 chart, which is amazing, especially at that time when albums were just being churned out right and left. It's been certified five times platinum and remains Boz's best-selling album. Boz on the meaning of the album's title, which I've always wondered, right? Wonder no more, boys and girls. It was just something I had scribbled on the side of a page. The last thing I do after I record an album is name it. Self Degrees doesn't mean anything specifically. It's just an image I couldn't get out of my head. It reached the top five on the club play, black, disco, and pop charts, and also did respectably on the AC chart with it, with its peak at number three on the pop chart. So that tells you how diverse this album was. There weren't a lot of albums hitting on all those cylinders. At the Grammy Awards in 1977, Lowdown won the Grammy for Best R&B Song. Skaggs also received nominations for Album of the Year, Best LP Package, Best Vocal by Male, and Best R&B Vocal Performance by Male for Lowdown. And Joe Wissert, just Weissert or Wissert, I think I said it Weissert, or we'll go with Wissert now, received a nomination for Producer of the Year. So if you haven't been with us before, the, the music will not be in the video, but it'll be in a Vimeo link below. Follow along with me. Thanks again, Joseph. Well, let's get to the album opener. What can I say? Boz and David wrote it. Joseph says, in the U.S., this was the least successful of the four singles released, peaking at number 42, but in the U.K., it landed number 10, making it Boz's biggest hit ever on this side of the pond. It also reached number two as a double A side with Lido Shuffle in Australia. So this is the point where I say, Despite what Boz wants me to do, I'm sorry, Boz. I will have the lyrics up as always. What can I say? Nice tenor sax on there to give it the smoothness. Just really well done. Great professional sound, which you're going to hear on this entire album. He's basically telling this girl, he, he, he says in here, 
Come on, tell me that you love me, dear. I've been feeling down some too, after all. It's time I made it clear. I've just been waiting on you. Oh, and then it's like we get that, that call and response. What can I say? Oh, you make me know, baby. What can I do to show you that I care? What can I say? Got to have your number, baby. So at first, I'm thinking that, you know, they have this relationship and he just feels stronger about him than she does. But come on, boss, you don't even have her number, man. You don't even have her number, but... A, uh, a nice way to start this album off. Next up is Georgia, just written by Boz. Joseph says it contains musical and lyrical references to Georgia on my mind. I was actually wondering that. Notably, the Moonlight Through the Pines line, which is given a bit of a twist here. Uh-oh. All right. Georgia, another fantastic song. Great arrangement. Lyrically, I mean... <laughs> As it plays out, I mean, I think the girl might be, you know, a little under 18 and he's with her and he's kind of telling her, you know, tell him, Georgia, tell him it was consensual. But I see somebody thinks, no, nah, it's about a bank robbery. I don't know where you get a bank robbery out of here. I mean, Georgia will be together, dear. If they ever let me out of here, they will say that it's not true. But I did it all for you, Georgia. Won't you tell them for me, dear? And then we get into those lines. Georgia, girl, I never lived through a night like that. Sure enough, got your loving where I like it at. Moonlight through the pines, oh, oh, oh. But how are we to know? That wasn't moonlight. There were searchlights. Oh, no. So they're coming to get Boz and, and they get him. So kind of funny there, man. All right. Let me know what you think this song's about down below in the comments. Now we'll go to Jump Street, also written by Skaggs and Paige. Joseph says, Les Dudek guests on the slide guitar. In a contemporary review, Boz noted Jump Street was written 10 minutes before it was recorded. I did a rough vocal standing in the studio just screaming out words that work phonetically. The music had been written on piano just before that. It was just one of the areas I wanted to cover. The original rhythm track was completely rock and roll. I wanted it to be as raucous as possible. Jump Street, just a nice jam, right? Uh, David on the keyboards is just fantastic, but everything is is great there. The drumming's fantastic. The guitar work, which there's three guitarists credited on this album, so I don't know who's doing what, really four, actually, so I don't really know who's Doing what? I mean, he just wrote about an area right Jump Street, right? We got some uh, ladies of the night out there. We got all kinds of things going on out there. He's just describing a uh, a street that has those kinds of things going on. A real lively street, we'll put it that way. But it was a fun jam, man. It's just a jam session. Now we're up to the fourth track. What do you want the girl to do? Written by Alan Toussaint. Joseph says this track had been recorded by Bonnie Raitt as What Do You Want the Boy to Do from 1975 album Home Plate. And we go on to be the opening cut on Little Feet's Lowell George's 1979 solo album, Thanks, I'll Eat It Here, to which Ray, Pace, and Picaro would all contribute. The only outright cover on the album, Boz's previous two releases, have been about 40% covers, including several Toussaint compositions that one Boz had history with. He said, quote, that came from when I was 13 years old. Alan Toussaint was a hero there. Steve Miller and I had our own band and listened to T-Bone Walker, B.B. King, Ray Charles, and Jimmy Reed. And then there was a New Orleans influence, Huey Piano Smith and the Clowns. Aaron Neville, and of course, Toussaint. I've done an Alan Toussaint song on each album, but I've never met him. It's strange. Of all the musical people I know in the States, I've never come across Alan. All right. All right. What do you want the girl to do? Very good writing on this one, even though I know they didn't write it. But the whole the whole story is, look, man, this girl loves this guy, our protagonist. And he's kind of laughing at her. He's probably cheating on her, treating her badly. Yet she still, she knows who he is and loves him anyway. So the, the message is kind of like, dude, you better wake up, man this girl really does love you and she'll put up with you, but probably not forever, nor should she. So started out, I didn't care for it too much at the front half of it, I would say. Then it's kind of started growing. It's still my least favorite song on here, but I mean, that's not that's not a slight to it. Next up, we have Harbor Lights, one of them that Boz wrote on his own. Joseph says, Skaggs says, Percaro was greatly responsible for setting the tone on this one. That was a songwriter presenting a song and getting back an interpretation from the musicians that wouldn't have been possible without his unique interpretation. I'd throw it out in the air, Bob said, and this kindred spirit would collect it and transpose it back to me in a way that would have that would give the song new meaning and a new life. Jeff approached his role more like a songwriter, a singer or an arranger would approach a song. All right. Got us a little flugelhorn solo on that one from Chuck Finley. That was a nice little instrumental run there. This one's the longest song of the album, so it did have a minute, seven seconds before Boz even started, started in on the vocal. So they let that one breathe a little bit. I'm not crazy about this song, but it's not bad. I mean, if you like this style, I, on this on this first side, this ended out the first side. The first three songs were my favorite. These last two are fine. And the song, like the others, grew on me as it went. Uh, I didn't exactly care for Boz's vocals as much on this one. And I usually do 
appreciate his vocals. They have a, a charm to them, but not a bad song. Now we're going to move on to side two. And one of two songs on here that have just an enormous amount of streams. We have a lowdown. And I actually have some notes on this before we get to Joseph's thoughts. This one was written by Skaggs, Skaggs and, uh, and Pace. Initially, Silk De Degrees received a lukewarm commercial response. And similarly, the first single release from the album, It's Over, barely cracked the top 40 in the Billboard Pop Singles charts. Peaking at number 38. One day, however, a Cleveland R&B radio DJ began playing Lowdown straight off the album. That was at a time when DJs had much more say in what was played on their programs. Public response was very positive, and soon Skaggs' record label, Columbia, sent the song to other R&B-oriented radio stations for airplay. It broke big on the top 40 pop stations as well. When its official release as a single, it became his first major hit. It reached number one on the Cashbox Top 100, which was a, a chart that was very close to being on the same level as Billboard for a long time in the United States. Number three on the Billboard Pop Singles Chart. It's also successful in the R&B and Disco Singles Charts, peaking at five on both. Major hit in Canada, peaking at, peaking at two. Minor hit in the UK, topping out at 28. Skaggs is quoted as saying that the success of Lowdown was, quote, an accident. And that even though it was their favorite from Silk Degrees, he and the others involved in the making of the song thought their, quote, wasn't a chance in hell that it would be released as a single. The single was certified gold for sales of one million copies and go on to win the Grammy Award for Best R&B Song. Joseph gives us some quotes. Louis Shelton said, Lowdown was just one of those tunes where you just had to count it off and everyone fell into a groove. I had some kind of distortion box there, and when they pointed at me, I just went into, you know, some solo lines and stuff, and that record just sort of made itself. I think we went into a bit of a jam session at the end for about a minute. We also did that on Harbor Lights, and fortunately, they kept that in when they mixed the record. Usually, the most fun part to listen to is the last 30 seconds where the jams are going on. Pace asserts he never thought it would be a hit, but it grew so heavily thanks to Percaro. Boz agreed, speaking in 1992, shortly after Jeff's passing, he said, quote, he did a lot more than just keep time. He actually moved me as a singer through the song. Everybody in the band would know what was coming up in the next few bars because we could feel it in the way he anticipated, the way he moved us towards it, like a rider moves a horse. That's a great quote right there. There we go, Lowdown. I mean, I didn't recognize this song. I know I've heard it probably on a, on a, on a live stream that we do or maybe it's in a top 10 somewhere, but uh, a really good song. The, the musicianship is fantastic. You, you got... Uh, Carolyn Willis, Marty McCall, Jim Gall Gilstrap, and Augie Johnson on background vocals which are important on a lot of these songs, but really important on this one. And of course, the keyboards, uh, David is just firing on all cylinders. You got Louis Shelton on guitar with Fred Tackett. Hunt Gate, of course, on the bass, Picaro on the drums. Everything just works on this. The story is really good, too, because uh, his girl is running around town showing everybody everything that he got her, you know, and, and so... Uh, a buddy of his is telling him, hey, boy, you better bring the chick around to the sad, sad truth. The dirty lowdown. This guy is not loaded, right? He's trying to impress her. People go through this at the start of relationships, right? They try to impress the other person. Maybe the other person gets the wrong idea about whatever, in this case, that this guy is loaded. So the rest of the song, he's got to let her know. I wonder, 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 wonder who taught her how to talk like that. I wonder, wonder, wonder who gave her that big idea. Oh, I wonder, right? Wonder no more. It was my man here just trying to impress her. So. Great song. Now we'll go to the next track. Don't have much on it. It's over from Skaggs and Pace on the ride. And Joseph says the first single, which just gave Boz his first taste of the top 40, I mentioned it earlier, went to 38. It's over. I thought that was a really good tune, actually. You know, he's telling her, look, it's over. It's my fault. Get out of here. He's not over her, but it's over. He wants her to get away because he can't take it anymore. The relationship must seem so bad, yet he doesn't want it to be over. And he doesn't, you know, we've all, well, I would say we've all, most of us probably had that relationship or many where it's like, look, man, it's over. So get away from me because I'm still in pain and you keep coming around or talking to me. And it's not making things any better. We got to move on. So I thought that was good. Next up, we have Love Me Tomorrow. Pace's only uh, solo writing credit, Joseph tells us on the album, adds another genre to a, to a diverse album, reggae. Jeff recalled in the 80s that, quote, the most reggae I heard in my life was probably Bob Marley. I hadn't heard Peter Tosh or any of those cats yet. Maybe the most up-to-date record that could tell you what I'm talking about would be Kid Charlemagne. But if you listen to that groove on that and on Haitian divorce from the Royal Scam, Steely Dan, that's Bernard Purdy. You'll hear some of the same kind of groove on the Aretha and King Curtis Live at the Fillmore West Downs, both of which Purdy played on. That was my main influence for Love Me Tomorrow, but it's a bad imitation of Purdy. All right, Love Me Tomorrow. I actually thought that worked. It could have went south, right? I was thinking Boz doing reggae, this could turn bad, but he didn't try to overdo it. Didn't try to become Bob Marley. It wasn't some sort of... Uh, cliche thing where he was trying to do his best Marley. So 
I thought that really worked. You know, of course, Picaro on the percussion is so important in a reggae theme, but you had uh, Bud Shank, Plaz Johnson on sax that really worked in there. And uh, Pace was on the Fender Rose, but also on the Mini Moog synthesizer. So it all kind of just worked together. And I actually thought it was a pretty good effort. Next up, you see it below, Lido Shuffle. Pesh and Skaggs right in. Joseph says, Baza said that Lido was a song that I've been banging around and I kind of stole. Well, I didn't steal anything. You don't want to use the word steal in music, right? Somebody's just getting ready to, to sign their name to a lawsuit. I just took the idea of the shuffle. There was a song that Fats Domino did called The Fat Man that had a kind of driving shuffle beat that I used to play on the piano and I just started kind of singing along with it. Then I showed it to Pesh and he helped me fill it out. It ended up being Lido Shuffle. Pesh recalls a very different source of inspiration. He said it came from something Skaggs heard called Magneto and Titanium Man from Paul McCartney's Venus and Mars album. We do have a full album reaction of that. It's kind of a 50s doo-wop thing, which he played on piano. I came from the Elton John school, Page says, and immediately wanted to beef it up and make it more rock and roll. So it got harder edged. Of the intro, he said it was Jeff and Hungate on the first eight bars. Jeff has these signature intros, identifiable. You have Lowdown. You have Lido. You have Miss Sun. You have Roseanne and you have Africa. Those are all Jeff Picaro intros. You know it's him. And Joseph puts in parentheses, and as we know, those are all great all cap songs. I I, uh, I don't necessarily love Roseanne in Africa. That's a story for another day. This was released as the album's fourth single, 11 in the U.S., 13 in the U.K. Australia number two, as I mentioned earlier, is that double A side hit with What Can I Say? I mean, surely I know this song, but I know it's really famous, but maybe I'll know it when I hear it. Lido Shuffle. See, I didn't think I, I didn't know if I knew this song. I definitely know this. I know the chorus. I didn't know any of the rest of it. You know, it's a little bit before my time, but I was still listening to the radio as a little kid is five or six years old. But uh, he's either, you know, Lido's heading out. He's leaving his family. And, and then he's, uh, he's, he's probably gambling a little bit, little cards. And then he might be robbing something. He's heading for the border. He's in Chicago. So I don't know if he's going to Canada or Mexico. I would think Canada from there. But that whoa, whoa, whoa. and the keyboard work on here. Is just fantastic. David's on Hammond organ, piano, mini Moog, and Moog. And the way he blends that in when they go into that solo is fantastic. And you got one, two, three, four, five. You got eight horns players on here, two guitar players, of course, Hungate on bass, and then Boz on lead vocals and guitar. So I guess you got three guitars on. This song is just fantastic, man. It's like all musicians firing on all cylinders. So what a great song. But we still got one more left. We have We're All Alone, written by Boz. It became a hit for Frankie Valley of all people, in 1976. The next year was a top 10 hit for Rita Coolidge in the U.S. and the U.K. Skaggs introduced it on his 1976 album, this one, of course. It included as the B-side of two of the four single releases, including uh, Lido Shuffle. Joseph said Boz has said songs like Lowdown just seem to come naturally, but has highlighted this track as being much harder to complete. He said, quote, that song was very, very difficult for me to write. And it came about after years and years of poking around at it. And it finally emerged. All right. Maybe I know this song too, since it was a, a top 10 hit in, in 76 or in 77. Maybe. We're all alone. Second to start. I, I know Rita Coolidge's version, but that was a heck of a version by Boz, right? I mean, this shows his vocal prowess, man. And you had tons of horns guys on here. Again, nice strings. Uh, David's just on the piano there. It's, this is all really about the vocals and, and just, you know, it's a love song, man, but so well done. And that will transition me to my favorite tracks. That one's going to be really tough, isn't it here? Uh, honorable mentions will be Georgia. It's over. And my faves are going to be, what can I say? Jump Street, Low Down, Lido Shuffle, and We're All Alone. So if you're scoring at home, there's 10 songs on this album and seven of them end up here, right? Now we'll get to my overall score. S the second side is actually way stronger for me, even though I liked the first side. And that's rare on an album, but you know, it has, it has Low Down and, and Lido Shuffle, We're All Alone. Even the Love Me Tomorrow, the, the patience, uh written song that's reggae works and then it's over uh, is on there too. So uh, overall score on this one, I'm going to be at a sky high 8.75. If you like this kind of music, you're going to love this album. This album is great, man. I mean, I don't know how much of it I revisit. It's not really my thing, but I can I can definitely appreciate great musicianship. And, and Boz is fantastic. I don't know, like I said, the writing on here by Boz and, and Pace is is great, man. So I am glad that uh, that Joseph brought this to me. I really didn't know a whole lot of Boz before this, but I can see why this album 
is so highly acclaimed. Let me know what you think of this one. What overall score do you give it? What else should I check out from him? And until next time, guys, I will see you.